Hello, I'm June Edwards, and this is Senior Topics class. Today's date, let's see, this is for the week of the uh, 16th of May. So I hope you're ready to fasten your seat belts. We're going to go to outer space and back and go around half of the world. So I hope you're ready to travel today. And so let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is what happened this past Saturday on the 15th was Armed Forces Day. Normally there would be parades and one of the largest in the country would be in our own Torrance, which is just a hop, skip and jump from here. But because of the restrictions still on, even though we're now in the yellow phase of the COVID restrictions, we still are not having our Armed Forces Day Parade. How did Armed Forces start? Well, <clears throat> they wanted citizens to come together and thank the military for their patriotic service in support of our country. So President Harry S. Truman, after World War II had ended, led the effort to establish this as a single holiday where it would be a one day celebration for the Army, the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps, the US Coast Guard, the Air Force, and our newest branch, the Space Force, which we'll hear more about later. Parades, open houses on the bases, receptions and air shows would be uh, the hallmark of this new event, which started in 1950 on May 20th and has continued every year since. So it's been going on for uh, about 70 years now. So I wanna give you 10 interesting facts about Armed Forces Day. First of all, before 1950, each branch was celebrated separately, but now they're all combined together in a great big thank you. And we hope that you will tell a veteran this week, thank you for your service and how much we appreciate their efforts to keep us safe. Fact number one, the Department of Defense or DOD is the largest employer in the United States. There are more than one and a half million active duty personnel, 1.1 million National Guard and Reserve personnel, and 700,000 civilians working for the DOD. Fact number two, 31 of the 44 presidents have served in the military. President Teddy Roosevelt earned the Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor in the military. Number three, the US military is one of the largest providers of international aid and disaster relief. Ships called Marine Expeditionary Units patrol the oceans watching for signs of danger and can reach the shoreline of nearly any location on earth within a day and a half. Next, the DOD owns nearly 30 million acres of land worldwide. In our country, it is the single largest consumer of energy. Number five, only 28% of Americans ages 17 to 23 are eligible for military service. Nearly 1.4 million are active military personnel. It is a volunteer army. There's no draft right now. The next one is number six. Military uniforms are not covered by taxpayers. I found that out when my daughter joined the Navy and my son joined the Army. In boot camp, military personnel are given an allowance for their uniforms, but it does come out of their paycheck. They also have to pay for any medals they earn, which can range from 15 to $60. Number seven, military members are more highly educated than the general population. If you enlist, you are required to have a high school diploma or a GED. 
So 99% of the military has a high school education. And on the other hand, only 60% of the general population has a high school education. And this came out in 2017. So I don't think that's very good rate. I think we should have more people graduating and we'll see how it goes. Anyway, the next one, the Lewis and Clark expedition that mapped out the Western half of our United States would never have happened without the United States Army. We think of those people on the Lewis and Clark expedition as explorers, but the members of the expedition were actually a small army unit. And who led them? A, um, a young Indian woman by the name of Sacagawea who was nursing a baby. Number nine, the US military began to desegregate long before civilian institutions. Schools and other public institutions were ordered to desegregate in 1954, but some of them took until the 1980s to do so. The army on the other hand, had the first desegregated troops during World War I. And that was a good uh, 40 years before. The last fact, number 10, the first time women were allowed to enlist in a non-nursing role was during World War I. The first women in the military worked in clerical roles as signal corps operators and as spies. This allowed more men to take on combat roles. In 1948, President Harry Truman signed an anti-discrimination bill. This attempted to put an end to racial discrimination in the military and also discrimination against women joining the military. So that's about Armed Forces Day and this is what the poster looked like also in 2017. Get you a real good look at it here. And I do not have a copy of the one for 2021 yet. So anyway, uh, you know, real security, according to General Omar Bradley, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he says, quote, real security lies in the prevention of war. And today that hope can only come through adequate preparedness, end of quote. There's many more quotes too, but I think that's a really good one. Just a couple facts about the Army and the Navy. I don't have time to go into all the different branches, but in the Army, uh, let's see, I already told you that the city of Torrance is one of the few stations that can host an Armed Forces Day celebration. And it was very, very large, although we have not had one the last few years. The army began on June 14, 1775. The Second Continental Congress formed the Continental Army as a means for the 13 unified American colonies to fight the forces of Britain. George Washington was unanimously elected the first commander in chief of the army. And he later led the colonies to victory and independence. The Lewis and Clark to the War of 1812, army officers, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark led the expedition into the Western frontier. It took them two years to reach the Pacific Ocean. In 1812, our new country, still suffering under British enforced trade restrictions and other unsettled disputes left over from the American Revolution, the US declared war on Britain for the second time. The war was a back and forth struggle. It is most notable for the shelling of Baltimore Harbor, which became Francis Scott Key's inspiration 
for the poem that led to the writing of the Star Spangled Banner. In 1846, the US and Mexico went to war following a period of border tensions. It was called the Mexican War. This featured several army officers who would go on to become important figures later on, including General Zachary Taylor, Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson, and Winifield Scott. In 1860, the Civil War began after a long-standing dispute over states' rights to allow their citizens to own slaves. The Southern states declared they were succeeding from the Union, and the war that followed was one of the most tragic and most important conflicts in American history. Then we have the World Wars, World War I, which began in the uh, around 1918 or so. And we have World War II, which began after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And <clears throat> World War II led to several milestones in army history and including the creation of the Office of Strategic Services later called the Central Intelligence Agency or the CIA. After the war, the army established the Medical Service Corps. And then after World War II, there was a standoff period with the Soviet Union known as the Cold War. Then it led to conflicts in Korea during the early 1950s and later in Vietnam, starting in the 1960s and going until the mid 1970s. In 1991, American and allied forces responded to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. That was called Operation Desert Storm. After the attacks of September 11, 2001, American and coalition forces again entered into a conflict in the Middle East against terrorist forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, the Army has many, many soldiers, including active duty and Army Reserve soldiers. There are doctors, lawyers, and engineers, electricians, computer programmers and helicopter pilots. And they constantly have to readjust as the challenges of these various wars continue. Well, there's seven things you may not know about our US Navy. First of all, uh, because of a letter from George Washington, the Continental Congress voted in October, 1775, to arm two sailing vessels with carriage and swivel guns so they could intercept British supplies. That is now called the birth of the Navy. George Washington was the father of the Navy. He had virtually no experience at sea, but he was an early proponent of the Navy, believing that besides disrupting British supply lines, that they could also uh, capture British ships. And they did capture 55 British ships before the Navy dissolved in 1777. Did you know that the Navy was disbanded after, after the Revolutionary War? Yes, it was. And I have a wonderful picture of John Paul Jones, who in fighting the British said, I have not yet begun to fight. And a wonderful painting of him. What a courageous man. The Navy was outnumbered about 40 to one during the War of 1812. They only had 16 seagoing warships at its disposal compared to more than 600 on the British side. But the US Navy did manage to win some single ship actions in the Atlantic. And uh, they also had African Americans playing a big role. Due to manpower shortages, 
a prohibition on using black sailors had gone out the window. The Navy haphazardly fought the slave trade even as slavery continued. In 1807, our Congress banned the importation of new slaves. For the next 35 years though, enforcement of the law was sporadic. The Navy rarely patrolled the west coast of Africa and only stopped vessels flying American flags. At the same time, other countries were denied permission to search suspected US slavers. Finally, in 1842, the U.S. and Britain agreed to cooperate in suppressing the slave trade. The next fact, we're up to number six, the Navy produced six future presidents during World War II. No president had ever served in the Navy until World War II. John F. Kennedy commanded a major torpedo boat that was run over by a Japanese destroyer in the Solomon Islands. Lyndon B. Johnson was briefly stationed in New Zealand and Australia, despite being a sitting member of Congress. Richard Nixon supervised air cargo operations. Gerald Ford served as an aircraft carrier's assistant navigator and was nearly swept overboard during a typhoon. Jimmy Carter attended the Naval Academy and became a submariner after the war. And George H.W. Bush flew 58 combat missions, including one in which he was shot down over the Pacific. In fact, from 1961 to 1993, the only non-Navy man to become president was Ronald Reagan. And number seven, fact number seven, the Navy won history's largest maritime battle. The Navy fought in numerous major confrontations during World War II, none more important than the Battle of Late Gulf, the largest naval clash ever in terms of ship tonnage. After U.S. forces landed on the Philippine island of Leyte in October 1944, Japan responded by dispatching virtually every operational warship it had left. In four separate but related actions, four Japanese aircraft carriers, nine battleships, 19 cruisers, some three dozen destroyers, and hundreds of planes matched up against 32 American carriers, 12 battleships, 24 cruisers, more than 140 destroyers, and some 1,500 planes. Both sides had submarines and small auxiliary boats. In the end, the U.S. Navy repulsed the attack, giving it essentially undisputed command of the Pacific Ocean for the remainder of the war. Now I wanna go on and talk about our newest branch of the service, which is the Space Force. And I have <clears throat> some pictures. Here's what the, the uh, badge on your arm of your uniform looks like. And here's a larger picture of the actual uh, emblem that was chosen they had a contest and many, many Americans entered it. This is the one that won the contest for the Space Force. But I wanna go on and I wanna talk a little bit. Now, what does the Space Force do? We know that its mission is to protect our country from enemy forces in outer space. And here are some of the projects in which it works. The ground-based electro-optical deep space surveillance system, or GEODSS, plays a vital role in tracking deep space objects. More than 2,500 objects, including geostationary communication satellites, are in deep space orbit 
varying in altitude from 10,000 to 45,000 kilometers from Earth. They also tracked the Chinese rocket ship that was out of control when it fell back to Earth, when they were trying to figure out where it was going to crash. Luckily, last week, it crashed in the Indian Ocean. The Millstar Satellite Communication System provides the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the U.S. Armed Forces with survivable satellite communications with low probability of interception or detection. The PAWS radar system is also maintained by the US Space Force. These radars are capable of detecting submarine launched ballistic missile attacks and conducting general space surveillance and satellite tracking. Space and Missile Systems Centers has the job of testing new missiles and uh, letting the Chief of Space Operations, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, the Space Force is under the uh, Air Force and the Under Secretary of Defense it responds to combat air and space forces. There is a space and missile system center, a space-based infrared system to detect enemy aircraft, a space-based space surveillance, which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, collecting data for man-made orbiting objects without the disruption of weather, time of day, or atmosphere. And the Space Rapid Capabilities Office, which has already saved the lives of uh, some of our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan still, when Iran has shot missiles at them. And the Space Systems Command is geared to deliver swift, responsive space capabilities. Now, the first class, the test pilot school graduates, the first space test fundamentals class on April 6th, just a month and a half ago at Edwards Air Force Base in California. 15 enlisted officers, civilian, airmen, and guardians represented the first class dedicated to testing within the newly contested domain of space. You can see them, they still have their masks on because it's COVID. Military, they all wear these black masks. You can see them, they're very, very uh, sophisticated uh, training there with uh, computers and the latest technology and most of their missions are top secret classified. So with this whole thing is designed to protect our interests in outer space. Now from that, we're gonna time travel. We're gonna zoom on back to May 20th, 1927. That's when Charles Lindbergh at the age of 25 entered a contest and won the first solo transatlantic flight. And here's a picture, a photo that was taken of him. And there he is, he got a sponsor and he named the plane for his sponsors from St. Louis. He called it the Spirit of St. Louis. Now, Charles Lindbergh was born only one year before the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, uh, flew the first airplane ride that was successful. There had been attempts in France, but the Americans were the first ones to successfully go any distance at all. He doubted, Charles Lindbergh doubted that he would successfully cross the Atlantic Ocean. He actually put his life in the hands of his airplane, but he did become the first pilot to solo the nonstop transatlantic flight. And when he did that, 
he changed public opinion on the value of air travel and he laid the whole foundation for the future development of aviation. Uh, you know, he had left college, dropped out of college. He was going to be an engineer, but he said, quote, the life of an aviator seemed to me ideal. It involved skill. It brought adventure. It made use of the latest developments of science. Mechanical engineers were fettered to factories and drafting boards, while pilots have the freedom of wind with the expanse of sky. There were times in an airplane when it seemed I had escaped mortality to look down on earth like God. And that's a quote from his book, We, Pilot and Plane, that was published by Putnam Publishers in 1927. After he won uh, this contest, which involved 3,500 miles, he toured 49 states and 91 cities. And then the Latin American countries persuaded him to come and tour some of them as well and describe what it was like on his flight. And he met his future wife, Anne Morrow. She was the daughter of the American ambassador to Mexico. Now, the other sad thing that uh, Charles Lindbergh, they remember, we remember him because his first baby was kidnapped. Tragedy struck in 1932 when the couple's first child was kidnapped from their home. The crime made headlines around the world. The Lindberghs paid the $50,000 ransom, but sadly, the boy's body was found in the nearby woods weeks later. A carpenter, Bruno Hoffman, was arrested and charged with murder. Although he pleaded innocent, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, he was found guilty and executed in 1936. The Lindberghs later went on to have five more children. In 1941, Lindbergh joined the America First Committee, which opposed the United States entering into World War II. Some people accused him of having Nazi sympathies, but after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the committee dissolved and asked the members to support the war. And that's what Charles Lindbergh did. He worked as a consultant to the US Air Force. He became involved in the environmental conservation movement and he wrote several books, including The Spirit of St. Louis, which won a Pulitzer Prize in 1954. He also, and I did not know this before, he also visited the Apollo 8 crew shortly before their journey to the moon, the first for humankind. Lindbergh died of cancer in 1974 at his home in Hawaii. And I just realized that I didn't give you the calendar events for this week. But before I do that, I wanted to do one more thing with a uh, geography, uh, uh, I have a picture on my Canvas website. If you go to noce.edu and you go into our class for senior topics, you will see the map that shows you all the places he went for his refueling stops on his trip across the Atlantic Ocean. But I have something funny here. International town names that will crack you up. If you enjoy traveling, you've probably come across your share of places with interesting names. There are many that get their names from other places, such as Athens, Georgia, Paris, Texas, and Ithaca, New York. Some towns and cities are named after heads of state. 
Washington, D.C. Jackson, Wyoming. Madison, Wisconsin. Sometimes people do what they do best. They get creative with their names. Sometimes they have a funny name and there's a funny story to go with it. Here are some of the silliest sounding international town names on any map. In the early 1800s, the Bowdoin Expedition set out to explore Australia's wildlife and landscapes. They came across a Western Australian bay that would one day become the famous Shark Bay Heritage Area. At the time, Freycinet, the French cartographer and explorer, thought the bay was blocked by a sandbar. So he called it Haver Inutile or Useless Harbor. But it's not really useless at all. Rather, it's home to the purest salt in the world. But you can't go on any salt gathering expeditions because the area is owned and salt harvested by the Mitsu group. The next one is a town called Worms and it's located in Germany. It may call to mind a place covered with creepy crawling worms, but the city of Worms actually does not have anything to do with animals of the same name. It's one of the oldest cities in Germany. You have to remember that the letter W in German is pronounced like the English V. So from a pronunciation standpoint, the name is still Worms if you're talking about it out loud. And there's a lot to talk about. It has a lovely wine and culinary scene, old churches, synagogues, gardens, monuments, and more. The next one is called Beer England, B-E-E-R, like the drink, beer. There are plenty of places to grab a pint at this picturesque village in England. But if people went around naming towns based on how much beverage is available, the world word beer would probably be all over the place. It was actually the surrounding forest that gave the city its jolly name it has today. The old Anglo-Saxon word for grove is beer roof. They shortened it to beer thereby giving future residents the perfect spring break marketing campaign. It was a fishing village, but there's also many other things to do there. The next one is a little bit gross. It's called Middle Fart, Denmark. Let's clear this up right away. Middle Fart is a name based on location, not anything else you may be imagining. It comes from the town's earlier name, Melfar, which is a Danish, Danish contraction, meaning middle crossing. Located on the northwestern tip of the Danish island of Funen, the city is situated at the narrowest crossing of the Little Belt, a watery channel that measures about a half mile in width. Although it sounds like a teenage prank, Middle Fart is actually a thriving cultural hub, complete with art galleries, museums, and incredible architecture. From Canada, we have the name Emo. Emo was established in 1899, named after a village in Ireland. Technically, Emo comes not from the music genre of the same name, but from an old Gaelic word, Ioma, which means resting place. This Ontario town houses a vibrant re uh, resort community with a nearly 100 year old hideaway lodge on Clearwater Lake. People come from all over to rest and find adventure. It's just north of Minnesota. And one more here, Yale and Mid-Yale, Scotland. 
Yale and Mid Yale could almost be the title of a bad horror movie, but there's nothing horrible about these places. Yale is the largest of the northernmost isles of Scotland's Shetland Islands, while Mid Yale is the most populated settlement. According to some sources, the names may have come from the old Norse word hejala, meaning platform. But you'll notice that Yale is connected to the mainland via a narrow strip, like a platform of land, which is known today as a tombolo. So there you have it, some unusual names, and I think you can probably think of more. Now, some other holidays or events. May 19th, the Ringling Brothers Circus premiered. What is your favorite act at the circus and why do you like it? And they still do have some circus shows going on in Florida. And I think that's just about it. Although I did want to mention that the Red Cross, the International Red Cross was established. Let's see if I can find the right date on the calendar. Yes, on uh, May 15th, it is also Peace Officers Memorial Day. So these are good things. Actually, the American Red Cross was founded, pardon me, on April 21st. And that is as far as we have time to go today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I certainly enjoy talking with you. And one of these days, we'll be back together again. Bye, everybody. Stay nice and cool during this gray May weather. It will get hot before you know it.